Well, that was a fantastic uh, talk. Actually, I think leads in really well to what I'm going to talk about today. Another effectless uh, talk, um, but a little bit different take on it. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what we have focused on in our protein engineering group has been not only on the desired effector function, but then once you have that eff desired effector function, you still need to be able to manufacture uh, that antibody. And there's some very specific qualities that you want to, to take into consideration. And of course, as Bill talked about, once you start mutating, making mutations, that can have a serious effect on your overall stability. So in this particular case, um, um, as Bill pointed out, you know, you, 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 there's a number of different effective functions, uh, qualities that you can go for. Um, in our particular case, um, we wanted to go with an effectorless molecule. And it's actually interesting because there was a slide that Bill put up about IGF-1R antibodies. And this specific project came out of our IGF-1R antibody program. It's an aglycosylated IgG4. Um, and we, the reason why oncology, the, our oncologist coll colleagues wanted that effectorless backbone is because IGF-1R, of course, is expressed on normal cells. So they didn't want any immune complexes um, forming on the normal cells uh, that express IGF-1R. But of course, this has a lot of other applications. So this is going to be a little bit more of a focus talk uh, in the sense that um, I'm going to give a very specific example of where we had a starting antibody with a desired qualities, but it really didn't meet some of the stability uh, uh, characteristics that we were hoping for. And what we found in some of our studies was that an aglycosylated IgG4 was our best starting point. And just as Bill alluded to, an aglycosylated G1, which is probably the most straightforward, obvious choice to make uh, in terms of a reduced effector function molecule, it's very straightforward, you just eliminate, eliminate your uh, glycosylation or site of glycosylation. Um, the IgG1 actually still has some residual effector function. And in particular, it has residual C1Q binding. So we found that the IgG4 agli really is a, a really good starting point. Um, and here, just we can detail. Let's make, see if I can get this. Um, so here we can detail some of just a th uh, thermal stability profile. Um, and uh, let's come on this side so I don't block anybody. And so here we have the different isotypes. Uh, G1 and the agli G1 and the G4 and the agli G4. And you can see, particularly for that CH2, is where you see the big shift, um, both in terms of when you go from your glycosylated G4 to aglycosylated G4, and also, of course, for G1 and, uh, and your agli G1. It's not surprising. You're removing your glycosylation. It's a very large part of the interface between the CH2 domains. Um, and so, of course, removing that adds quite a bit of flexibility to those domains. It's also interesting to point out that just in general, the G4 has a lower thermal stability or melting temperature for the CH2 than the G1. Um, the other interesting thing about, a, about the G4 versus the G1 is that there seems to be a greater sensitivity to pH in the G4. Oops, I'm sorry. So here we have... Um, just a number of different um, melting temperatures for a aglycosylated G4 over a different pH range, uh, glycosylated G1, um, and these are for CH2 and for our CH3s. And you can see, you know, as you go down to pH 5, 4.5, and 4, you really get a significant drop off um, in, your, in your melting temperatures. So you have this inherent um, lower stability uh, just at neutral pH, but then also you see a much greater sensitivity um, in the aglycosylated G4 compared to G1. Uh, not so much, I mean, a, a bit, yes. Uh, 